thank you all for coming. It's going to be kind of more of a conversation than a presentation. It's going to be pretty casual. Um, ACES isn't going to have a lot of events this semester. Um, so I'm glad you could all make it out here on another snowy night. Feel free to take food, sign up for the mailing list, take any flyers you'd like. Um, but it's uh, with great pleasure that uh, we have my good friend Jacob Silverman here. Uh, if any of you follow the Baffler blog, run out of MIT, uh, Jacob is a, a weekly contributor there. And um, his work has been published in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Slate, The Atlantic, The New Republic, and many other publications. In 2008, the Virginia Quarterly Review recognized him as one of the top literary critics under 30. And in 2012, he was a three-time Jeopardy! champion. So you need a ringer for your trivia team. This is the guy to speak with. Um, he's also on the board of Deep Bellum, a new publisher of international literature. Uh, Jacob lives in Brooklyn, New York, with his wife and two cats. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have him here. Next month, uh, his book, Terms of Service, comes out, which deals with privacy. And he's going to read uh, the intro of it, and then we're just going to sort of talk about different points and uh, what privacy means. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you all for having me. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. As I mentioned to Jesse, uh, my grandmother went here, I think graduated probably 70 years ago, but I've never been to Simmons, so it's cool just to check it out in what I'm sure is a much different version of the school. Um, here's a really early galley of the book, but this is basically what it looks like. Uh, it's called Terms of Service, Social Media, and the Price of Constant Connection. And it uh, goes on sale next month, um, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. And I'm just going to read from the introduction because I think it's like a it's a really good sort of uh, introduction to the issues I'm concerned about, not just in this book, um, and kind of also gives a sense of what we could talk about, whether it's privacy, surveillance, identity, all those other things. A quarter century after the advent of the World Wide Web, communication has become synonymous with surveillance. The only unrecorded speech is the chatter of two friends spending a moment together, and one day soon that will change. Sensors and cameras proliferate through our homes and cities like spores, appearing in eyeglasses, phones, streetlights, cars, game systems, shoes, jewelry, and wherever else a signal may be found. Eventually, if the technology industry's most fervent boosters are to be believed, our whole world and all of our sensations and thoughts within it will be transcribed. Not because it is right or good, but because we can, and because this information they promise will be useful. In this temple, anything is worth sacrificing on the altars of efficiency and productivity. In recent years, surveillance has become an inextricable part of our culture. From tech companies' lofty pronouncements that, by observing their users so closely, they can understand them and anticipate their needs, to the hundreds of millions of us engaging in mutual surveillance, crafting permanent online identities that allow us to see and be seen. This is the culture of social media, which has become a catch-all term, describing more than, than just Facebook, Twitter, and the other big social networks in which millions of people broadcast to one another simultaneously and trade in the currency of attention. Social media now refers to a set of technical features and social practices, real names, sharing widgets, fixed identities and profiles, behavioral tracking, data mining, the spreading of media and personalities through viral channels, a process of relentless personalization, that have come to define the web and our place in digital culture. The internet is being thoroughly socialized, which is to say thoroughly monitored, whether by another human being or one of the ubiquitous tracking systems that supplies data to social networks, advertisers, and market researchers. Social media is the number one activity on the web. There's nothing we spend more time doing online. One poll found that most British babies appear on social media within an hour of being born. Many human beings acquire a data trail almost as soon as they appear in the world, and sometimes before. Once created, it can never be destroyed. Only modified, added to, parts of it made more visible while others are suppressed. To become part of the social web, then, is to join the networks of surveillance, tracking, and data circulation that now support a vast informational economy and increasingly shape our social and cultural lives. Few aspects of contemporary life have gone unaffected by this shift by the ability to publish immediately, freely, and to a massive audience. Shareability and the drive to rack up likes and other metrics guides the agendas of magazine editors and the budgets of marketers. Sentiment analysis, the mining of social network data, 
to determine the attitudes of individuals or whole populations, helps intelligence analysts learn where potential extremists are becoming radicalized. Advertisers collect social media data and form consumer profiles with tens of thousands of pieces of information. Large corporations use social media to befriend customers, offer personalized customer service, and churn out friendly propaganda. Reporters uh, publish breaking information on Twitter before they do in their own papers. Far-flung friends and families stay in touch, share news, fall in love, argue about politics, and ponder the trivial, trivial, excuse me, trivial items of the day, all in what is essentially public view. Indeed, we are all public figures now, though few of us reap the benefits. We write and take more photographs than ever before, with these actions becoming less about capturing events than about sharing them. The fullness of our lives is confirmed by our, our place in these networks and by the size of our audiences. I share, therefore I am. More interesting, more sociable, more desirable, more myself. Social media is also part of the utopian vision that a number of major tech executives share. It is the means by which we will create better, more equitable societies, where problems will be solved by the harnessing of ever more personal data. Today's big, te big technology firms stand ready to lead us there. As Eric Schmidt, Google's executive chairman, describes it, quote, it's a future where you don't forget anything. In this new future, you're never lost. We will know your position down to the foot and down to the inch over time. Your car will drive itself. It's a bug that cars were invented before computers. You're never lonely. You're never bored. You're never out of ideas, end quote. Cell phone sensors, search tools, GPS, and the like will provide some of the data that will inform this future. But social media will lead the vanguard, trailed by the personal information, thoughts, feelings, reflections, and raw data that users provide, whether we like it or not. It will be made up of the informationalized versions of ourselves, as every aspect of human affairs becomes digitized, tracked, circulated, mined for patterns. The paradigm of social media is one that Silicon Valley would like to extend to society at large, a technocracy of benevolent but total surveillance. In this kind of society, profits flow to platform owners, not those writing tweets and sharing YouTube videos. This is a book about the technological moment and the one to come, about surveillance and celebrity, reputation and influence, the identity confirming pleasures of visibility, and the loneliness of overexposure, and the way we view our world through the Facebook eye, looking for shareable moments and performing a kind of informational triage, apportioning our lives through digital networks. It's also a response to cyber libertarianism, the reigning industry philosophy, which holds that large corporations, freed from the shackles of government regulation, claim to know what's best for us, and that digital life is inherently emancipatory. Mostly, we're only surrendering ourselves, in the form of data and personal autonomy, to oligarchic platform owners who sell us to advertisers, data brokers, and intelligence agencies. Popular tech writing tends to fluctuate between the two poles of Luddite rejection and unvarnished techno-utopianism. The former is generally considered far less respectable and easily stigmatized. As Richard Byrne wrote in The Baffler, in the straightened and highly ritualized discourse of tech boosterism, Luddite has become a catch-all, dirty word for anything that stands in its way." End quote. Byrne's smart essay about the history of Luddism offered a necessary revisionist take showing how it really began as a labor movement concerned with workers' rights and how automation would deprive skilled workers of their livelihoods. In other words, it's a, it's a surprisingly contemporary, flexible belief system, not the rigid extremism of the Unabomber. But even if this book is fated to be categorized as the work of a digital skeptic or neo-Luddite, I would argue in return that such perspectives are needed. Techno-utopians have plenty of allies in business, in government, in media, in every celebrity with a million hard-earned followers, or the fanboys who wait in line to buy a new Apple product on the day it drops. If there actually is some recurrent dialectic between technological skepticism and utopianism that we are locked into as a culture, then all the better that the people belonging to the former should be able to launch volleys like this one. Because digital skepticism is not about a reflexive criticism of the latest consumer gadgets and internet technologies. It's about political economy, labor rights, how digital technologies change our culture and us as social beings, how they create new economic and social divides, even as they claim to demolish others. This much-needed skepticism is against the powerless influence of those with money. It offers a doubting perspective on the grandiose claims 
of Silicon Valley titans and a sympathetic treatment of those who find the new digital culture stultifying or overwhelming. That's where the allegiances of this book lie, with those who don't have power, who don't have anything to sell. Talking about these issues, it's easy to f fall into what I call the tech-only trap, an excessive attention toward the transformative power of technology, a broad, vague term that could really refer to anything, but in these contexts usually describes social media, smartphones, the internet, and other recent digital inventions. According to this line of thinking, the internet is a cabinet of wonders, a place of magical baubles and trinkets, where life can only improve and where dissatisfaction is met with a dismissive wave of the hand. Those not having fun just don't get it. The other essential features of life, politics, power, culture, race, gender, are largely elsewhere, beyond the province of concern. When politics do enter the picture, it is only to proclaim the liberating potential of digital technology. Social media and smartphones will allow minorities and the marginalized to finally speak for themselves. They'll gr bring greater possibilities for democracy and personal freedom. As if governments from the United States to Turkey, Russia to Egypt, China to Azerbaijan aren't investing heavily in the latest surveillance and monitoring technologies, and in some instances, hiring fleets of paid pro internet propagandists and censors. In reality, the old powers still have standing in this world. They have the money and the guns. Their influence remains for formidable and won't be pushed aside by a popular hashtag. As the scholar Treber Schultz notes, quote, the essence of technology is not solely technological, end quote. Technology cannot be looked at outside its relationship to politics, sociology, economics, or culture. Nor is technology something neutral, just a tool that can be put toward good or bad uses, as so many techno-utopians are fond of claiming. Digital technologies have certain capacities built into them, though some of them, as the U.S. military might say, are dual use. The GPS chip in a smartphone can help you find a local restaurant, it can also be used to track all of your movements. Other digital technologies are more obviously beneficent or pernicious. Email is mostly a useful private communication tool, or it was private until Gmail and the NSA got their hands on it. Facial recognition offers few obvious benefits and is, by design, inclined to serve the needs of advertisers, intelligence agencies, security contractors, and other potentially untrustworthy actors. It would also serve us well to put some human agency back into the narrative. Too often, defenders of the technological status quo, which is the same as the consumerist status quo, deflect criticism with a couple of banal, of tact tactically useful responses. You'll get used to it, or this is just the way things are headed. This isn't really an argument, but it's effective. So too is the frequent claim that the introduction of new consumer technologies has created discord and confusion in the past, but we got over it then. We dealt with it and moved on, society adapted. For better or worse, one would rather not speculate. It's true that radio and the telephone inspired utopian and apocalyptic pronouncements in equal measure, and that neither came to pass. But this is also an argument for passivity, for assuming that technologies have some inherent path and will find some natural accommodation with society. It is also, if one takes a more jaundiced view, an argument for deferring to powerful corporations to determine the proper role of their inventions. And it assumes that every application of new technology is coincident with progress. Maybe some of this sounds familiar, but it's this very back and forth that is necessary, even if it recalls the debates of the past. We must shore up the levees against those forces, consumerism, irrational exuberance, the corruptions of power that erode them. There's nothing predetermined about Facebook's role in public life or in compromising our privacy. It doesn't have to happen. It can be pushed back against by informed criticism, government regulation, and our own practices as consumers. We can help determine the course of these technologies and how they affect us as human beings. There's a reason that Facebook's facial recognition system isn't enabled for European consumers, but is for Americans. The EU and European nations, by and large, have stronger consumer privacy protections owing to the continent's history of authoritarian governments Invasive, invasive surveillance, and more recently, social democratic governments. That doesn't mean that Facebook won't find opportunities to take advantage of European consumers in other ways, or to eventually make facial recognition a key part of its product there. But European government policies have worked, at least better than our own. There are things we can do to push back, and skepticism and criticism are a necessary part of this process. There's nothing assured about the march of Facebook. 
The company could collapse in a, de in a decade like so many tech giants before it. What will we do then? Will we sit back and marvel at the next charismatic mogul pushing a magical product upon us? The burden of proof on these companies to prove the burden of proof lies on these companies to prove the ethics and usefulness of their products and methods. Their promises of self-regulation and more relevant advertisements satisfy neither category, not while fat trade and personal data goes on in secret. Why should we rely on them to make innovative use of our data at profit to themselves and debit? monetarily, socially, culturally, to us. Their job is to extract value from the intimate details of our lives. And you can be assured that shareholder value is more important to them than some sense of altruism or consumer rights. Internet giants don't deserve our deference. As with government, our relationships with them should be adversarial, full of skepticism and critique. They show little loyalty to us, collecting, mining, and selling ever more of our data, and so they should receive little in return. As the writer David Columbia said, cyber libertarians, quote, refuse to construe corporate power on the same order as governmental power, end quote. The task of this book is to surface that and other types of power, to show how social media has affected the culture in our lives, and to show the kind of world that is being made as the bulk of us enters a period in which we might never be disconnected nor alone. Quote, there is not a lot of internal searching among, among engineers, the writer and computer programmer Ellen Ullman has said. They are not encouraged to say, what does that mean for society? That job is left for others, end quote. This book attempts to an answer that question, along with a few others. Where do we go from here? How does ubiquitous surveillance change our attitudes towards one another and toward our very sense of self? How much do we worry about the lures of constant connection? Or should we stop warring and learn to love life in the data stream? To find some answers, we have to start by examining the rhetoric and beliefs of the tech companies providing us these services. The way that this class of innovators views the world matters for all of us, for tech culture has become our, our culture. As one critic remarked, quote, they are building their values into the infrastructure of your life, end quote. We should be wary lest these values not match our own. So that's the introduction. Jam-packed introduction, no less. Um, what do you guys want to talk about? Well, I think before we get started, I also, I mean, in some ways the whole work is, is a bit polemical. Uh, yeah. And I think it's sort of more of a, a work about power relationships. Yeah. And I was curious, um, for everyone here, uh, I do apologize, we didn't get the Bluetooth working, so I was going to bring up uh, a Slate article that, that Jacob had written, which I believe was the impetus behind the book. Um, yeah, that kind of got it going. I, I mean, I was writing a little bit about sort of the culture of technology and life online and stuff, um, and that article really hit a chord. Could you uh, sort of explain to everyone like what that was about? And how sure, that sure. I basically said that in my sort of insular little literary world online that there seemed to be a lot of, uh, seeing a lot of it play out on Twitter, especially there was sort of a lot of glad handing and mutual admiration, and people kind of seemed afraid of criticizing one another. Uh, and I pinpoint the change in being that now that we are all online and, and kind of talking ab about one another in public view, we're very much exposed and people don't feel as comfortable critiquing one another. Um, the sort of corollary to that or um, necessary follow up is that most writers and any creative type are living so precariously now that we feel like we kind of always have to conduct ourselves um, kind of politely and with an eye towards networking, especially when we're in public view, because the person, even if you think you're you know, critiquing someone's work in good faith, that person may be um, on the other end of an interview or a fellowship application or something like that. And uh, I think a lot of people were resentful of that um, my point was not necessarily to attack specific people, though I, I did raise some examples, but, <laughs> but it was more to show how I think this is like an understandable kind of cultural phenomenon, the way it's developed. And uh, the sort of other element of that where I think social media really plays a big role and kind of an underexamined role is the primacy of advertising on social media because um, 
Obviously, every social, big social network relies on data collection and advertising. You, you probably know all those phrases like, we are the product. If you're not buying the product, you are the product, and we very much are. We're the laborers and the product on social media. But we're also continually surrounded by advertising and surrounded by brands and companies and celebrities and politicians trying to sell us stuff. So I think that one reason why there's so much um, self-presentation and branding and self-promotion on social media is the fact that we've kind of internalized it within this advertising dominant environment. So where you kind of came into this was a, an atmosphere of uh, a literary culture that was from the online presence was almost too gracious and yeah. too afraid to, to bring up severe or serious uh, literary critiques. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and again, this I'm just I was just speaking at the time about a specific subculture, but then I started hearing pe from people who say like, oh, it's just like this in music, or it's just like this in the art world, or or whatever. Um, a lack of sincerity. Yeah, I think well, social media is definitely performative in the way that like kind of all identity is performative, but in some ways it's even more theatrical and more deliberate in our performativity because we're really consciously thinking sometimes to a neurotic degree how are we representing ourselves you know is this going to be taken the way I want it to be am I showing sort of the self I want to represent to other people if I critique one portion of this, of this book or whatever online um, am I going to be totally misunderstood or labeled a malcontent um, so I think there are all those kinds of issues anxieties playing out online which consequently sort of herded people towards very sort of placid, polite behaviors. But then you talk to people in person, they'll say like, oh yeah, that book sucked, or, or it, wasn't, it wasn't very good because of X, Y, Z. Uh, and it might be a very smart, honest critique, but you can't, you, you can't post that online because then right. suddenly you're a, jerk. You're, you're a jerk, or you have to deal with your own anxieties about like, well, who saw this? How will it be taken? That kind of thing. Um, so can I? Oh yeah. sure, go ahead. Uh, so I, you know, I I don't want to like distill like everything you've said down to one thing, but like if I if I had to like sort of make a stab at what you're trying to say is that essentially like our new technocracy and the new like social media that's everywhere is sort of stifling self-expression. I think in some ways it is. I think that kind of by design. A lot of the big social networks uh, kind of hurt us towards specific behaviors. Um, there's a reason why the, the, your, your sort of selection of possible gestures on Facebook or Twitter is really limited. You can only favorite or retweet or write a reply. You can only like. You can't dislike. You can't really and, uh, perform any other gesture besides these, these, these really limited number of gestures which are basically designed to show approval. And that's because Which wasn't always the case on Facebook. Well, oh, what do you, you mean? Put thumbs down on Facebook. I don't know what the exact year was, but early on. Oh, I don't know. But um, but indirectly, like indirectly, right. you know, Social media by way of you, you you mentioned something about people are afraid to criticize each other. You're right. So and in that sense, like because they're afraid to criticize each other, people don't want to open up and like talk about how they really feel about what's happening in like the social media world and the direction it's going, which makes it go more in that direction? Well, I think there are kind of two poles, because you definitely have the, the sort of perpetual cycles of outrage that you'll see, especially on Twitter, that are kind of ongoing every day. And they're often um, you know, stoked by certain people within various kind of subcultures. Um, and that's kind of its own sort of groupthink and tribalism, where um, every every new sort of faux scandal or that comes down the pipe is is treated as horribly offensive, and everyone kind of gets riled up and starts being awful to one another. But then on the other hand, you have more, uh, and this is where I think the advertising influence is really deeply felt. You have the kind of the cheery networking side of social media where um, people are very conscious that like this is public, that, that they don't know who's seen this, that this may be part of a future job application or performance review, and so consequently they are kind of limiting their range of behaviors to be 
sort of very polite and, and or just to you know to be kind of conventionally self-promotional uh, go ahead okay in your opinion with the advent of all these things where every single moment of our life is digitized at this point and everything we do is looked over and watched over you know we have to be monitored by the PC police basically and all these things and everything we do is online from our love life to our school to everything we look at nowadays the first thing you do when you wake up is you check your Facebook or whatever it's kind of interesting to see how, what the influence will be be on the future generations, the ones that are growing up in all this, right. they have like shorter attention spans. Will they be able to go and value things outside of this, or even have the ability to turn it all off? Yeah, um, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, that's something we'll have to see. I, I mean, I do worry about that. Like recently, I was traveling in uh, Cambodia, and every hostel I went to mostly had Wi-Fi, and um, Everyone there was just looking at their at their gadgets. It's like uh, Wi-Fi has ruined hostels, I think, because they they've, <laughs> they've kind of become desocialized as social spaces. Like uh, hostels are known for people from all over right. the world coming together, having a few drinks, like talking with strangers. And at a lot of these places, people were just looking at their gadgets to communicate with people back home. Um, and it's certainly a lot, I'm not against most of these forms of communication, but that's a kind of very specific example in which you can see that this like desire for connection, they can't break it. People who are on, supposed to be on vacation, who are supposed to be, and I'm probably guilty of this in some ways, but are supposed to be out exploring the world and having new experiences, they still kind of retreat into the comfortable familiarity of those devices. Um, I'm sorry, was there something else? No, it just kind of reminds me, there's this like really small bit 2000s movie called Existence, Oh yeah, yeah, uh, Cronenberg. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. It talks about how, like, basically, you're literally connected physically, biologically, to your devices and your virtual reality. And even though that was, you know, a little apocalyptic and its discernments and everything, it's kind of like it actually is becoming that way where people feel naked when they don't have the technology with them. And we, they grow up with. I see my kid, my cousin's kids, and they don't know life without having something in their hands. You know, when they're at a restaurant, they need to be quiet. Yeah. They have, you know, their Netflix of. Barney or whatnot. Sure, sure. They have no idea what it's like to go outside and just ride a bike all day. They've never done it. Yeah, and there's definitely a kind of conditioning I think that goes on. And this is where kind of the engineering side comes in with how these products are designed. I mean, notifications uh, that you get, whether it's uh, pinging on your smartphone, emails, little bubbles that pop up on when you're on the service itself, or if you get desktop notifications, you know, there's endless numbers now. And those are all designed to condition you to, well, for, the first thing is come back to the network because someone wants to talk to you or someone want, is dealing with you. Uh, whatever you're doing is not important. Come back right now. We need you. Um, that's sort of the message. And um, I mean, I still have some notifications on devices, but I've gotten rid of a lot of them because I just realized how useless they were. On the other hand, the, the uh, kind of reverse of that is that now I go to the platform to see if anyone had been trying to talk to me. Um, there's like the conditioning of FOMO, you know, instead of yeah, fear of missing out. Sure, sure. So there are these ways in which it's, it's kind of a mix between um, kind of social customs that have developed, I think. But I think very much here is where you can point to the design of these products and say things like, I mean, we, we, might, we might take notifications for granted, but you can even see like recently Twitter's introduced new types of notifications. And they've introduced also uh, an ability to look at more statistics related to your tweets and kind of do uh, quantitative analysis about how well your tweets perform, like for anyone. It doesn't matter. I mean, this is stuff that mostly businesses used to pay for, and now Twitter's offering to everyone. And the whole point of this kind of stuff is to keep you chained to the platform, to keep you having reasons to go back and kind of analyze your productivity and try to you know, optimize your personality even to be a, a more productive social media user. No, it's interesting. I, when I was graduating college, I went to the career center and was like, oh, you know, here's my resume. You know, should I brush up on anything? They said, you know, if you want to get a job, you have to be on Twitter. You're not going to get one otherwise. And I don't have one. My grandmother does. Yeah. But I don't. She mostly tweets about Dancing with the Stars. Yeah. But it's scary <laughs> to me to think that, like, I can't be productive in the society if I don't know how to use a client to use social media and use it constantly and have a brand and a presence and be on the top 5% of my LinkedIn. Right. Twitter. Yeah, see, I think that kind of stuff is just so misguided and in some ways insane. I mean, one of the points I make later in the book where 
I talk about labor a lot, and, and uh, you know, there are a lot of good things about kind of the user-generated web or Web 2.0, whatever you might want to call it, which is basically everything from like the mid-2000s on where users create most of the content, whether it's Yelp reviews or Amazon reviews or every social network. Like there's some good features to that, but we are undoubtedly laborers. And so when people say we're creating the value that makes these companies so rich, they make a, a useful platform, but we are, are the people creating the value. Um, so when other people are telling you that you need to be on Facebook, whether it's for your own good or whether it's or on Twitter or whatever, or whether it's for your job, you might be creating some advantage for yourself or even for your employer but you're also doing a lot of uncompensated work for the platform owner. Um, and I also just think it, it's, it's it, I think it's also just become this trendy thing too, like it, career, maybe a career center or a guidance counselor or whoever else thinks that they're being responsible by telling you to put all your time into all these social networks. Well, I mean, I've applied for many jobs over the last, you know, since basically the Great Recession started, and I don't think I mean, most, and you know, I've had some interviews and stuff, but um, I don't think any of the time that I spent on on LinkedIn or online social networks or on filling out online job job applications has really been worth the time put in. I mean, I mean jobs and those and the things that kind of flow from them are still often obtained through like normal human social networks when you talk to a friend and they refer you or something like that. One of the things you mentioned about the, the sort of uh, two poles. Yeah. Your responses and uh, there's one interesting uh, facet that you described with that that sort of tribal like this thing offends me so deeply and then there's just a sort of backlash and right. a lot of a uh, sort of manifestation of that is the idea of uh, plagiarism yeah. being caught up and and then how like um, a persona and their reliability and their trustworthiness is, is very much a sort of currency. You've seen that now with yes. Brian Williams' yes. sort of uh, discussion about the helicopter yeah. the fire, and I guess what's your opinion of the role of the freelance writer or of the blogger in in maybe uncovering? Uh, I know um, you spoke before about Free Zakaria and Jonah Lair yeah. and your sort of role in that. Like, how does that come into play in terms of responses, like information and ethics and responsibility? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll try to break it into a couple parts. I mean, I think what you say about reputation is very good. Um, the, in the book, I have a chapter about sort of a new reputational economy. And this is, uh, I mean, pretty big. It's, it's sites like Reputation Defender, which you can pay to try to kind of scrub or manipulate your data trail and make your Google search results more positive and things like that. But it's also um, just the fact that Many, many jobs now are conducting back, automatic background checks on every applicant and things like that. And we really have so little control because there's so much data about us being produced and, uh, and utterances of us, of ours, and relationships and associations being spread everywhere, often without our knowledge. You may not know what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of an algorithm you trip or whether, one comp whether you have certain indicators on your Facebook profile, perhaps because of certain groups you've joined. Like maybe you join some like left-wing groups on Facebook and some company that is uh, doing a background check on you for a job decides, no, nope, that's a red flag. Um, so there's this way in which reputation, um, in terms of like the data-driven reputation, is becoming really important. And then there's the, and really difficult to kind of control and get a handle on and, and to know how it's used uh, and possibly used against you. And then there's this other side, I think, of kind of the more public reputation of what people think of you and how one, once it's sort of, once that kind of trust or once there's some chink in the arm or some flaw exposed. True, truer, it's more of a, of a perception. Right, oh yeah, perception is reality in a lot of ways. Um, then the responses can be so heated. And I think there are a few reasons for that. One is, um, I mean, Self-righteousness has always been a popular pose for anyone, even before the internet. But it does play really well on social media, especially on Twitter. Um, so, um, and I think this is why I kind of there's so much outrage theater because when you can become angry at something, even if the target perhaps is deserving, you're suddenly on the good side, you know, and you're you're presenting yourself as virtuous 
you know, oh, Brian Williams blew it, he sucks, I know better, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I spent time, my time, reading your work, and you plagiarized Yeah, and, and I'm did. personally betrayed by you, Fried Zakaria, or John Allaire, or whatever. Um, and in a way, it makes it difficult to kind of, like, judge the degree of the offense. Um, for a lot of these famous people who seem to, like, fall down in the public eye uh, and be become subject to some storm of online outrage, the cost actually isn't that great. Like, they may lose some money or, you know, I doubt Brian Williams is going back to NBC News, but these people are still going to be rich or famous or, you know, be able to have, you know, have some sort of career. Um, but where it gets much more dangerous is when everyday people become the target of that, of that outrage. Uh, when people are briefly elevated into sort of the viral spotlight and become like the fool of the day of, of the day on Gawker or whatever else, or it's like you know a lot of this stuff plays on um, the poor or minorities. So it's like look at this couple that was caught having sex in Walmart, featured story on Huffington Post or Gawker.com has their mug shots, has their names, a hundred other websites pick it up. Um, you know, look at these rednecks from Wyoming who did this, or whatever. Like, those are the types of people who, I mean, if they ever try to get a job or some, or perhaps even some social service, um, and someone looks them up online, like, that's never going away, and they have no way to get over that. Um, and I think that's just such a real problem, and I think it's something that people don't really think about when they kind of launch into the, the public shaming or the storm of outrage. Even if the response seems deserved, um, it's sort of like, I always wonder what's the end game, or what does it mean to be constantly sort of a member of these, uh, of these, um, of these online storms of outrage, and to be doing this every day with sort of a new villain cycling through every day. Do you think, um, you think there's some, like, marginal, like, like, it's it's all you know. The go people go through the motions whenever that happens. Like someone gets exposed, there's a scandal. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh my god, I can't believe this happened. And the people are like, I can't believe I did that. So and so. <laughs> but at the same time, the more that happens, like the more and more marginalized people feel in their everyday lives, and they start to think to themselves, like, do you think that like fuels people like to to do like like stupider and stupider things or like sort of push themselves toward that spotlight even though they know that once they're, they've entered it, you know, it's probably not going to be, the attention they get won't be good, but, but they, the, the pull of, of being recognized for something, anything, sure. you know, in, in a world of like, you know, just, you know, futilely multiplying and expo exponential, like, zero healing people. You know? Yeah. You know, no, I think that's a good point. And I think that's sort of the reality TV ethic that carries over to social media. And I think those two uh, forms of media have a lot in common, which is that uh, potentially, and if you have the fortitude to handle it, all publicity is good publicity. So if you go viral for the wrong reasons, because you did something awful or kind of shameful or embarrassing, it could be just as worthwhile or potentially Renumerative or um, or just satisfying to one's ego as as you know having a popular Etsy store or or saving a dog in the str in the street that then someone captures on video and it's, it gets a million views on YouTube and you see this even with like kind of socialites intentionally releasing sex tapes and acting like they're leaked and stuff like that. Um, I'm not saying it's a it's a good plan, but I don't necessarily I'm not gonna like you know, kind of get all moralistic about it. I get why people do that. I mean, especially when kind of our collective attention seems to be just flitting between these various uh, trending topics or people. You know, we're not all looking at the same people at the same time, but, you know, each of us is probably reading about the same, like, funny videos or, or kind of average shows made as celebrities of the moment. There are plenty of people who might want to do that, or if they're being interviewed for a newscast about some you know, crime that they witnessed, they might act crazy on the newscast because they hope the, the video goes viral and stuff like that. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's almost like the 
21st century version of an audition tape for real world. Um, because there's this kind of nebulous sense that um, even if it seems like a bad idea or may not pay off immediately, like maybe you can leverage it into something else or there'll at least be the, the satisfaction of trending. Like you see this all the time on Twitter. It's like people tweeting at celebrities or sometimes it's like this kid is dying and it's a little sad or whatever, but they're like, let's try to get X, Y, Z trending. Um, a lot of people just want that status on, in itself. Like that mean that has become, become something for people. It doesn't really mean anything to me, but for a lot of people, that's that's enough, you know, to feel famous. I, I think, I think social media makes people feel famous or want to feel famous. You're either on Facebook, it's more likely you're you're just famous for your your imagined audience, which is like the, your friends and people you know and your coworkers and stuff. On a far more open network like Twitter, your audience is potentially everyone. So there's a sense I think among a lot of social media users. And you see this also on Instagram, when, especially when people like post a lot of glamour shots and stuff like that, um, that there's a sense that people feel like they should be famous or that they are already famous, but they're just not recognized. And so when, once you know, the right post or whatever uh, finds the right audience and maybe goes viral, then they'll finally like, kind of be recognized for their personality, acquire some more legitimate fame. And uh, I think some people pursue that kind of paradigm deliberately, some unconsciously, but I think that is kind of a, a common path or way of thinking for people. So choices of Europeans have made some slightly different ones, but in an age that deals with bulk and advertising numbers, uh, what kind of choices are there, really? Right. And it's not just personally, but as, like, how is this, what are the forks in the road here? Sure. Well, um, I mean, personal choices, of course, you can always choose whether or not to use these products. Um, that's, but that's difficult, yeah, because sometimes you might need it for a career, to sign up for other... Uh, now you have logins from Facebook and Google and stuff like that, which you need to, to, lock, to so sign up for other products. Just to interject really quickly, sure. our school mail is through Google. Yeah. yeah. And it's not a choice. And right. We, no, we, I don't, it's fair to say we couldn't function without using Right, right, sure. And Google's, as you know, is such a huge provider of email and services for universities, corporations, cities. Um, in ter so, and and then there's also the very personal thing, which is like you don't want to be uh, you, if your friends are all on this platform, you want to be there too. Um, I I deleted my Facebook account, and now I don't know when anyone's birthday is. I don't get invited to some parties. Um, but I have to kind of deal with that. Um, but on a bigger level, I think what you're talking about is like where some forks in the road might be. I mean, there are people who are doing really good work to try to get privacy legislation passed in Congress. Things like, especially related to data privacy, getting more access to the data that companies hold on us, having more right to see that data, to have it deleted, uh, to know how it's used. Those are pretty increasingly among like the privacy crowd, those are seen as like increasingly basic fundamental rights even. Um, Ron Wyden, the senator from Oregon, who's a big NSA critic, uh, is, is big on this. Um, and I know there are a couple bills in Congress right now, but I'm not a policy expert, so I couldn't tell you exactly. Um, and I think also though, one ch a big change needs to be that we need to find new business models. The, the data collection and advertising model is good for corporations, but it's pretty bad for us. And the reason why it endures is because it helps scale up products really quickly when they're free and when they just grow in terms of the number of, of users who, who come on the network. And that's what venture capitalists want. They want companies that scale up really fast and then that they can make a huge payout when the company is bought or when it, it, it uh, has an IPO. Um, and that is not just like a business problem, but it's also like a cultural problem because everyone who starts a tech company or who goes to Silicon Valley, like every entrepreneur wants the big payday, wants a 10x growth company, um, and the people funding them do too. Um, so that, so it's kind of like both a business and a cultural problem. You have to have people who decide, well look, I'm going to try to create this internet company and not, maybe not rely on venture capital, or rely on other investors who aren't counting on huge growth, but maybe want 
steady growth, build a solid business, returns over time, that kind of thing. Or, who, or start a company where you charge users, start a social network where you charge people. I mean, WhatsApp was charging people, it gave the option, I think, to charge people like $3 a year or something like that after it started, uh, and then was bought by Facebook. But um, I think that kind of experimentation is important, and I mean, granted, like, where it's really lopsided against it, but I think also as more discontent builds with sort of the status quo and how, the, and how like, we are so subservient to these platforms, I think you'll see a little bit more of that. There was app.net and diaspora, which were like two efforts to have ad-free social networks that didn't collect data and that were more decentralized. They kind of came too early, and one of the app.net founders, uh, one of the diaspora founders committed suicide, and so the whole project kind of fell apart. But then, like, over the summer, you might have heard of Ello, which, like, blew up for a month and then was gone. But that still at least, like, I think shows an interest. Um, so I think all those kinds of things. And then the third thing I'd say, sorry, and then uh, if you want to follow up, but the third thing I'd say is the problem right now is also that the, the U.S. intelligence community and Silicon Valley are basically in the same business of data collection. And it's become more adversarial uh, in, in the last year because, the, because, first of all, a lot of the tech companies are really upset that you know, they, were they were being very uh, good, uh, good citizens and cooperating with the NSA and responding to subpoenas and enrolling in the prison program and all that stuff, but that wasn't enough for the NSA who then hacked into their databases and, and did all kinds of other things, into their data centers, that is. So now a lot of them are upset and they're losing contracts with European countries, so now they're, they're feeling it uh, in terms of cash flow. And they're acting all self-righteous, you know, and like Tim Cook gave a speech over the weekend about digital privacy. It's nice that they're getting a little upset, but as long as tech companies are in the business of collecting huge amounts of personal data and controlling it among themselves, intelligence agencies are going to want it too. Um, and they're going to get it one way or another. So you need changes in the law about how surveillance is done, um, and also a kind of a, politically we need to realize that ma mass dragnet surveillance and data mining doesn't actually help f uh, find terrorists, as unfortunately I showed here in Boston with, you know, the Boston bombers were known to local law enforcement and, and were still able to carry off their attack. That's been the story over and over again, recently in France, same thing. Um, so you need those kinds of changes too whether it's additional protections for how and when uh, the government needs to get a warrant, how much data companies can store and for how long, how much data the government can store and for how long and on whom. All those kinds of protections basically don't exist. I mean, a lot of that kind of surveillance and privacy law is 30 years old, if that. Uh, so uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, do they make um, are they profitable? No. Um, I know, I mean, Google's profitable, right? Yeah, Google is very profitable. I mean, Google is profitable because it's the biggest purveyor of ads on the internet, um, which is like totally ironic because they say like don't do e don't be evil, and then they're basically the biggest surveillance operation there is. Um, Facebook makes money, um, and they own Instagram. I don't know if Instagram itself is profitable but it's profitable enough, or it brings in enough money and is still growing quite a bit. They have uh, increasing ads within the stream as well. Anyway. Yeah, and, th and that's another thing you'll see on Twitter. They're starting to increase ads because Twitter's revenues are, are pretty low and their share price has been s stumbling. And so, the, I mean, it's kind of sad almost because Twitter is, can be a good service, I think, but it's really moving more in like a Facebook-like direction, which is like, you see the, the fee being sorted a little bit more. You see tweets that from people you don't follow, but someone you follow favorited it, or something like that. You see more advertisements and all these kinds of things, more promoted tweets. Um, and that's because Twitter just hasn't been able, and more of these um, notifications and stuff, because people they need people spending more time on the site and clicking on more ads, and it's just not really happening for them. That would be a business model. If a lot of these companies that scaled up real quickly eventually don't make money, and yeah. investors might try to look for something else that does make money. Yeah. That would be. It, it's possible, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the other problem is that, like, let's say Twitter goes under and, and in a few years or something, 
or it just starts contracting because they are worried already about slowing growth and about a lot of inactive accounts and stuff like that. Um, and maybe they start shrinking and someone buys them for pennies on the dollar or whatever. Um, I just don't necessarily trust Silicon Valley to take the right lesson from that because they might say like, well, I mean, the way Silicon Valley operates now, it's like monopoly capitalism. I mean, Peter Thiel, the PayPal founder, who was in the first Facebook and one of the first Facebook investors, um, he openly talks about how if you start a company today, it should have monopoly potential, which is just kind of insane. Like he writes about this in his book, um, and it's just kind of insane because. Um, sure, I mean, out of self-interest, if you're building a business, you want it to be huge, but that, that kind of leaves all these other possibilities off the table. Um, so I'm worried that people will say, if once Twitter starts stumbling or fails altogether, well, they just didn't scale big enough or something like that, rather than like, well, maybe we need to reassess our models. Um, because, look, on, on social networks, it's great to have everyone you know there, but I think increasingly, especially as you see pe all these young people moving to private messaging apps, there's sort of a sense that like you don't have to have all your friends there, or that different social networks could serve different purposes. Maybe you like Tumblr for certain reasons, but Instagram is where you practice your photography and stuff like that. Um, and Snapchat is where you talk with your family or your, or your girlfriend, where you send naked selfies to your girlfriend or whatever. Um, so I th like that would be one of my hopes too, is that they kind of change the mindset, but also find business models that will allow them to say, like, we don't need to all, all become monopolies. We can have companies of various sizes fulfilling different functions, and that's the sign of a, really, of a healthy economy. Because right now, I mean, you've probably heard that, like, Silicon Valley is sort of going through another bubble. People say it's not as bad as 99, and when it bursts, it'll be okay. Who knows? Um, I mean, some of these companies are definitely overvalued. There's a site called Jet.com. Hasn't even opened yet. It's supposed to be an Amazon competitor. They have like $220 million in funding. It's valued at like near a billion dollars, and they haven't even opened. They haven't sold anything. Um, so there's, I mean, that is a bubble. But then you have the other problem of like when this bubble pops, it's mostly going to be bankers who, who lose on their investments. Not like, it won't be, a lot of like regular people lost money in 99 and 2000 because they were day trading or investing in their retirement accounts. And I think there's less of that now. So when the bubble pops again, it's mostly going to be VCs and banks who are just going to say, well, let's just do it again. Or like, or a good thing I invested in Twitter and Uber, and they're fine. Um, and that covers all my losses. Um, so yeah, I'm just worried that they're not going to learn the right lesson, but we'll see. Um, back to like the policy side. Um, sure. I know that there's still the, the, a strong pull in Washington to go the exact opposite way with um, privacy and things. I mean, the NSA case is going before the Supreme Court soon, and I actually heard one of the legislation proposed if the Supreme Court uh, rules against the NSA in that, is to um, it, it require all telecom companies to keep five years of meta metadata yeah. so that, okay, if we can store our sellers, make the companies do it by right. law, and then we'll investigate it. So, yeah. Um, what, yeah, what things how are we going to really have the government do anything about privacy in some cases like that? And yeah, I think that's tough because when I hear that kind of thing um, about you know the telecoms holding on to the data uh, or, or onto metadata phone calls instead of the government itself, to me that in some ways it's even worse. Uh, it, it depends on your point of view, but it's certainly pretty similar to the status quo. But what it does is it makes the telecoms kind of partners in government surveillance, which they've pretty much always been. Um, uh, there are people with more historical knowledge than me, but who could say that AT&T has been around a long time in various forms, have bas has basically always been a government partner in surveillance and wiretapping and all these sorts of things. I mean, for many years, um, every telegram, I think this was like in the 50s or so, every telegram that went through the United States um, was was tracked and the metadata was was stored, um, so and that and what happens is also given that telecoms of all the tech companies I think telecoms have shown the most uh, cooperation. You have things like AT and T setting up rooms, most famously in San Francisco, in an office there, 
they set up a room where they had a splitter. This was uh, this guy named Mark Klein blew the whistle on this a few years ago. They set up a splitter that mirrored all internet traffic coming into that facility and sent it off to the NSA. And apparently they had these at facilities around the country. The, those were probably not things that they got a court order for. That was probably something where an NSA chief goes to the CEO of AT&T and says, we really need this. Maybe we'll, we'll give you $10 million or something like that. And then it happens. Um, so just saying that you know, AT&T is going to hold on to the metadata and maybe we have to have a subpoena to access it, um, it's just, it's not very reassuring to me and it's not really a big change from now, especially when right now a lot of stuff they don't need subpoenas for or the subpoena is just incredibly easy to get because you just go to the FISA court, it's not, there's no one to defend the other party, it's not adversarial and you just tell the judge and 99% of them are approved. Um, and this, that's sort of the problem also is that there's so many surveillance programs going on and we just don't know what they all are. Like just a few weeks ago, like Wall Street Journal reported on one that the DEA had been uh, tracking license plates all around the country. Um, local police departments do this too. Private companies do it where they have cameras in public spaces, photograph license plates. And some of these license plate databases have millions uh, of cars in them and they can f find out where you were all kinds of times. Or um, I think it was also the, D or the US Marshal Service, another recent report, uh, was running this program where they put these kind of boxes on the bottoms of light planes, flew them around, and just sucked up whatever cell data they could. Um, and so that, and this is, these, these are programs where we don't even necessarily know what they're really for. These aren't supposed to even really be about fighting terrorism. Um, so I'm just not very optimistic about the, the kind of reform happening that's needed. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't say like that, that some is worse than nothing, but there's just still such a ways to go before it's even all broken open so we can see what's going on. And then one of the big problems we talked about is that right now you don't even need probable cause for any of these, um, these searches or any of the data, basically. So stuff we're talking about, what we really need is a legislation or even another amendment to um, force the government to actually have probable cause for different things. Or there's a chance that the Supreme Court might do it themselves for us, but at this point it's hard to know if you get five votes to um, change kind of Fourth Amendment probable cause law. So Yeah, there's the ACLU of Massachusetts is really good on this, actually. I interviewed someone from there for my book, and um, they've been really trying hard to lobby for privacy legislation here and in D.C., but... Their main point is just that, um, you know, is, is kind of based off the Fourth Amendment, is that law enforcement should have to get a warrant. Very simple. That there shouldn't, that dragnet surveillance shouldn't be allowed, um, mass surveillance shouldn't be allowed, and that when the government is interested in someone, they should have probable cause, have to go to a judge and get a warrant, just like it's always been done in criminal cases. And it, it's kind of a very simple idea, but it's terrifying, I think, for law enforcement because they, there's been, the last 20 years, they've been given so much power, especially with all these new technological tools. And even at the local level with local police departments using these devices called stingrays and other devices to track cell phone calls and listen on calls and stuff like that, that suddenly you're gonna take all their toys away. But really, it's very constitutional and a, and a more traditionalist idea is just to say, get a warrant. And it's a very, also I think, easy, I think it's an, it's an easy thing to campaign upon uh, as a public interest issue and if a politician ever really wanted to get really behind this. I know some like Ron Wyden and, and Mark Udall before he got voted out of office in Colorado were kind of pushing this. So I mean, this has been wonderful. We do have to uh, wrap it up a bit, but I, I just did want to interject. I think any reasonable person would object to, to malfeasance uh, on a privacy level on the behalf of the government. Um, anyone doing uh, sort of sort of rampant uh, privacy violations, and I and I think most people would want business models with um, sort of sound earnings that are reasonable, as opposed to this insanely exponential scalable venture capital model that seems to pervade Silicon Valley. But I do want to interject. Um, you know, Linux technology and the sort of user-based, um, people throw around the word innovations a lot, but it is, like, there are a lot of, like, engineering 
breakthroughs that have happened because of this technology where people can share all over the world on the internet is like really one of the most powerful tools um, in, in history. And I, I, I guess I, I just want to interject that I, I do like life in the data stream. Sure, sure. And that's, I think, fair. that's fair. And there's a professor here who uh, we've had some country because he doesn't think that, that Google should should be the provider of our email. Yeah. It's a privacy violation. And that, I mean, and I think this is where a lot of the problem comes in. I think Google is quite practical. I like the way they set up their mail service. Yeah. The way eventually Microsoft Word is going to be unnecessary. As an app, it's going to be unnecessary. Well, that's why they're giving away for free now. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, no, I mean, I think everything that you're saying, I think the book is worthwhile. I'm so grateful that you came to visit us, uh, to the Sims community and ACES. But there is sort of a differentiating um, privacy, business, government, as a sort of information science, software engineering, sure. computer science, which it's impossible to truly separate them all. But it, it's kind of hard to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, no, I understand. And I mean, certainly I like a lot of these services too. I've tried to get away from some Google stuff, but it's hard because right. like they do make good products and they're useful. I would just like more control over how like my personal identity in life right. is used and, and my personal data. Um, and you mentioned Linux, which this is sort of the irony, I think, in some ways of kind of how the tech world has developed, which is that you know, somewhat famously in the 70s you had like the Chaos Computer Club and these tinkerers in the, in the Bay Area. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were hacking into cell phone networks. There was like amazing research being done at, uh, at Xerox Park and in all these other research labs and stuff. And tech was like, and even the early internet, though a lot of it was, was Defense Department sponsored, which is important to note, but a lot of these people were just career scientists and researchers right. and stuff. And then you had this sort of rowdy or counterculture influence group that came in and were doing like, you know, hacking and a lots of interesting things and, and free software came out of that and Linux came out of that and stuff. And the sort of irony, the sad part is that a lot of that's gone, that they just can't really compete and that everyone who was a rebel uh, in some way, pretty much, not all of them, Richard Stallman and some others are still kind of doing their thing, um, has kind of been co-opted or, uh, or or got, are hired by a massive tech corporation. And yet at the same time, they're still preaching this like this empowerment of how technology is gonna empower you and liberate you. Um, I mean, as you can probably tell, like I don't feel like a lot of stuff is empowering and liberating. On the other hand, if a lot of our communications technologies were truly decentralized, if the cost of using them, if they were free without data collection or I had to pay for them and didn't have to put up with data collection, if you know my movement, my behaviors weren't constantly tracked. Um, if all my communications were encrypted, so no, so no intelligence agencies or other people could read them, then I think you would start seeing like the real kind of libertarian emancipation that a lot of these people maybe hope for or talk about. Um, and and you know, and some companies even in this sort of like corrupted landscape are doing better than others. I like Firefox. I, I think Mozilla is, ge is generally on the right side. I think they're a nonprofit, and um, and they've still achieved decent market share. So there is room there, and like even things like Tor are becoming more popular, like post Snowden. Um, and one good change has been that like all of the big tech companies are suddenly getting behind encryption which they weren't before. Like, I was trying to set up PGP encryption recently for my email, and it's like, it's so damn hard. <laughs> and like, I think I set it up, but now, now I'm thinking like, well, who's gonna email me? Uh, <laughs> an, an encrypted email. Like, I, yes, I am a journalist, but I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily like break sec uh, trade secrets or government <laughs> secrets. Like, so I don't know who's gonna wanna send me encrypted email, but I kind of did it just to, you know, to dip into it. But it shouldn't be so hard. Right. And, and I think, you have a lot of people talking about this, but one interesting thing over the last year has been there have been all these stories about these sort of like these dudes, sorry, I mean they were just mostly men, male programmers in like Germany or elsewhere. Um, no, well, I mean if you want to get into gender issues in Silicon Valley, that's a whole other 
<laughs> awful thing. <laughs> yeah, but you have these people who are working on like really interesting and sometimes fundamental products. Like if you remember the heart bleed bug, people are like, well, here's this piece of free open source software that's used by most of the servers on the internet, and it's like supported by like 50 grand a year, and two guys work on their spare time, and one full time, I think. And and these companies that are so rich are not really investing in these products in these projects that really serve everyone. So it's, then after that, you had some money going to that. But recently, there was this German guy. There was an article, I think, on, on Fusion, which is a new site about him, who uh, writes a popular or works on a popular PGP uh, tool. And he said, you know, this is a guy who could have gone to work for a big software company, but is a true believer and kept working on his encrypted communications project for years. And but can't support his family. And then there was a little bit of publicity around him and he got some money, like you know, Facebook or someone tossed him 50 grand. But there are all these people on the fringes who are doing really cool stuff. And like that's where kind of my technophile side does come out when I hear about these people who, despite the temptations of a bigger payday or just giving up or whatever else, are like doing cool innovative things with technology, things to let people communicate securely or let people run their own websites or have their own communications platforms but not have to submit to this higher data hungry authority. I guess, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, questions or comments before, do you want to read that quote from the beginning of the book? Sure, why not? Was there anything else? You brought a secret copy, right? Uh, I wish I could. I don't, this is like a, uh, the yeah. free publication copies are called galleys, and this is like a really early galley. It was like printed in the publisher's office. Um, so did you self-publish, or did you go through a? Uh, no, it's being published by Harper Collins. Um, the that, release day is next month. Yeah, next month. March seventeenth. So, yeah, so I don't have a finished copy yet. Though apparently I'm getting it tomorrow, like a hardcover and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks so much. Um, if you go on the website, which is uh, I left the link to, and I'll email out again if you want. Um, you can get an ebook copy. Yeah, so. yeah. If you, just the <laughs> <laughs> but if you want, um, you know, it's available for pre-order on all like the online retailers: Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Harper Collins, and stuff. Is this where I think the broke college student thing is? <laughs> What's that? Okay, here. You want to read uh, the friend? Oh, okay, so this is an instant message exchange, <laughs> and we're gonna. Yeah. This is the this is the epigraph to the book. You know, like the quote that opens the book. So this is an instant message between Mark Zuckerberg and a friend after Facebook launched. All right, I'll be Zuckerberg, of course, because <laughs> uh, I have a massive ego. Uh, Zuck, um, yeah. So if you ever need any, if you ever need info about anyone at Harvard, just ask. I have four, over four thousand emails, pictures, addresses, social security numbers. Redacted friend's name. Uh, what? How'd you manage that one? People just submitted it. I don't know why. They trust me, dumb fucks. <laughs> so, I mean, I, have, I tend to say stupid things. I think as a 20-year-old, I certainly said stupid things. So it's kind of, on some regard, unfair to judge someone uh, by what they wrote when they were 20. But uh, Yeah, I thought it was maybe a little bit petty to put in the front there, but, but I couldn't help it. Perfectly. I couldn't help it. Um, but I, I do, you know, look, I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg has matured since he was 20 years old or whatever. On the other hand, I mean, whatever maturation has come has surely been accompanied by a big inflation of ego and a sense of, you know, world historical purpose like all these guys have. They all think they're changing the world and they all kind of, you can see in their public pronouncements. I mean, this book, I go through a fair amount of speeches and rhetoric by Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg, Eric Schmidt, all these people. And I try to take them seriously and like take them at their word, which is that they really think they that they know what's best for us and that they're like willing that we should trust them with their lives. So even if the sort of maybe his language is cleaned up and he's gotten a little bit more responsible, but I think that beginning is worth keeping in mind. <laughs> he's, he's scared. You think he, he's, he's scared? scared? Yeah. It's it's a like the dumb fuck thing. It's a joke. He's terrified that he's got all this. It's very true. He doesn't know how to handle the type of power that. Well, I don't know. Maybe it. Who knows? It's a message we can talk about. <laughs> That's I true. Would, I would say that it sounds like he's scared. It's very possible. Yeah. There's enough people on Facebook to watch Zuckerberg from hacking it. <laughs> sure, do things that. Yeah. I, can I 
say just one thing. Like, I think you you mentioned one more thing about the impact. Like, the technology is supposed to empower you. Yeah. And I think, like, it, that's true to some extent, but I mean, it's more true, you know, if you're already like in a position of power. So when these new technologies came along for people who were already like in authoritarian positions, like their power just became a lot steeper and a lot more intense than it was before these new technologies came out. Oh, I, yeah, I very much agree. And that, and look, I mean, uh, you hear people say things like, well, Facebook helped start the Arab Spring. Well, that's not really true, but what is true is that people in urban areas in Egypt and Tunisia helped use Facebook and Twitter to organize demonstrations. That's that small part of the story. On the other hand, authorities were able to use really sophisticated monitoring technology, a lot of it built by American and Western companies, to monitor everything these people were saying, and it was actually in the authorities' interests to let them conduct their business online so they could see who were the leaders, who knew who, like a social network was the kind of thing that the Stasi wanted to know about dissidents. They wanted to know who was in their social network. And now you, you put your social network up for display. Um, and then there's sort of the milder version of that, which I, uh, of what you said, which I agree with also, which is that for people who are middle class or kind of can handle these technologies and know how to manage them, how to get the most out of them, how to protect their privacy to some extent because you can't protect it fully, it, you, they probably, it probably makes their lives better, they have some advantages. But if you're a poor person, if you're some elderly person who's supposed to be getting your social security you know, by, through the mail or something, but suddenly someone wants you to do it on, through an electronic system or something like that, you know, there are all these kinds of divides that show up uh, for people when, they're not, when they don't know how to use this stuff or they don't have access to these tools. And that, that's kind of a lesser considered part of my book, but I think that's a real problem. Like, I have an elderly uh, relative in New York who, I mean, even uh, a boss at, at a bookstore I worked at who's probably, who's a baby boomer in her 60s, like, is using a computer is just like, it's a, the, the biggest challenge for them, just doing the basics. And to think that, you know, when these companies say like, well, you have control over whether you want to be tracked this way or that way, or you can decide whether or not to use this feature and stuff like that, that's just not tenable for a lot of people because uh, they just don't know how or don't have the time or opportunity to like, you could go crazy man trying to manage your whole life and your whole digital life and locking it down so that everything is secure. Thank you. Yay. Well, thank you guys. Uh, I appreciate yeah, all the questions. It was fun to talk. Yeah.